Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I've got my Kleenex, so y'all just grab yours because you're probably going to need them. Um, I, I, I wanted to share with you a, um, a part of Donna's journey over this last couple weeks that I was with her. The last week that she was in the hospital, I was with her 24 hours a day. I stayed right by her bedside. I did not leave her. Um, and that was partially because she needed me. And you know, nursing staff at the hospital, they can't always take care of you like you need to be. And the other part was because she asked me, don't leave me. So um, I've had many calls and questions as to the whys and how comes. And it's normal. It really is. It's just part of the emotional process that we go through when we, lo when we lose somebody that we love. And as Pastor said, is a valuable part of our, our body. So the Lord started dropping things into my heart um, even before she had passed, uh, probably three days before she passed. And uh, there was a lot of quiet time and a lot of thinking time as she would rest. And so I just started jotting down things the Holy Spirit gave me. And this morning from three o'clock to six o'clock, the Lord woke me up and gave me a message for the church. And so I will finish with that. Um, but I'm just going to take you through a brief journey of Donna and, and part of what we shared. And the Lord gave me uh, the title, and the title is, With Each Step I Take. In spending time with Donna, you have to... <clears throat> And spending time with Donna uh, this last week that she was with us, the Holy Spirit was very, very close to her. You could not walk in that room, as Pastor said, without bathing in the Holy Spirit. It was probably one of the most awesomest experience that I've had in the Holy Spirit because when God's Word says He's the great comforter, you can believe that because He blankets you with that comfort in those times of need. The Holy Spirit was so close, and there was no question if there was a need or um, a, a pain level because she was in pain, and we just prayed, and I can tell you she did not have to have any strong drugs. They kept trying to push morphine on her. She's like, no, no, we just prayed, and that was a miracle. That really was a miracle, and... Uh, um, he was so close to us. He was reassuring us all the time that he was right there in his presence. The Holy Spirit came to me a couple of days ago and asked us to share uh, to my heart. And, and I want to uh, share with you to help give you comfort with the struggling of Donna's passing. Five years ago, Donna had a diagnosis of liver cancer. Many of you will remember her testifying to that. Um, she, they had actually um, went in and found that she was having some gallbladder issues and she went in for testing. She ended up having to have her gallbladder out. They actually had to do a reconstruction of her bowels and they also found that there was possible shadowing on her liver where they thought the cancer had started to uh, grow. So. Um, I met Donna 12 years ago when we were still over in the old sanctuary. She came up to me uh, after a Sunday morning service, and she said, Sister, would you just pray for me? I'm struggling. I didn't think a lot about it because I've had many people ask that, and she was a familiar face, though I really didn't know her at that time. I was not aware of her struggles and how she wrestled with the different things that I learned over the years that we shared. She struggled many times with the thought that how could God use her or even love her in the condition that she was in. We all do that when we first come to the Lord. We, uh, the enemy tries to come in against us and just pull us back, wear us down in our minds, tell us that we're not worthy of him. And this was a familiar battle that she also had at that time. 
There were many situations that she came in that she shared with me out of her family, which I began to understand it was the enemy trying to keep her in bondage and shackled in her past and not allow her to grow. But with each step she took, she was moving closer to her heavenly home. Donna had qualities that I saw the closer we grew in our friendship, and I knew God would and could use her. She needed a friend. As God used our friendship, the church was revamping at that time the Sunday school department and rearranging some classes and age groups. We were in need of Sunday school teachers. The Holy Spirit in prayer kept bringing Donna before me to be used. One Wednesday night after service, we had together, got together for dinner. I brought up the subject of helping in Sunday school. She was shocked and said she was not the person to do that. <laughs> I smiled at her reaction, but in my heart, I knew God had already chosen her to be a part of the Sunday school. Um, I asked her to pray about it, and we went on and talked of many other things. Over the next year, I reapproached her several times of helping in the Sunday school, and she promptly told me, no. I'm not the one, she'd say. And then one night, the Holy Spirit told me, as we were visiting over dinner to just tell her he was wanting her in the Sunday school department. And if she would just take that step of faith, that he would use her in the Sunday school for the children. Her steps then were even leading her closer to her heavenly home. That next Sunday, she taught, and she was scared to death. She shook. It was so... I smile because I remember the first Sunday school lesson, and some of you teachers probably do too. You, everything that you wrote down and had in place and all the words fit, and you can't remember a doggone thing. You even looking at the paper, it's like you can't remember what, was that on my paper? I mean, it's, it's amazing. But that's the humbleness, or should be the humbleness of your spirit when you take a position in ministry or you're sharing salvation with somebody you need to have that humble spirit and trust me i thought she was going to pass out a couple times i was kind of right there at the edge of my seat um, over the next couple years she did struggle some with her faith only because she just wasn't sure where god wanted her she would feel comfortable for a while in the sunday school and then she'd say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to lay it down because I just, I've got to make sure I know God wants me there. I've got to. And, you know, I could see it, and others could see it. Pastor could see it. But she wrestled with that. And some of that had to do, and I'm just going to be open here with her past. It was kind of like a haunting to her. She, she struggled with self-esteem. And I share that because... We need to know it's okay when we serve God with struggles. It's okay. Every single one of us through this walk here on earth, we're going to struggle. I don't care how mature you are in the Lord or how long you've served the Lord. You're going to struggle at times. You're going to. Keep your faith in the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I may be crawling right now or I may, I, I may be on my knees right now and they are bruised up. But keep your eyes on him, because he is faithful. He is faithful. She would say, I'm not sure where God wants me. I'm so scared. I don't want to be out of God's will. And that was the major fear of Donna, was being out of his will. She cherished knowing that she was in God's will. And I told her, I said, don't take a step. Just stay where you are. He'll show you. He'll show you. I asked her, do you feel the peace of God about teaching in the Sunday school? Yes. And, and continued on, and we prayed together to take authority over the enemy from trying to keep her captive for those things that were weighing her down in the past. I would pray with her, and we took the authority over the spirit of fear, which many of us struggle with, uh, and the feeling of unworthiness. And all that comes from the enemy to take us away from that faith or that place in God because the enemy knows where you're going in the Lord. Every single one of us sitting here, whether you think you can be used or not, 
have a place in this body. You have a place in God's kingdom. And we need, in this time and hour, to realize we need to be asking God, where do you want me to be used? It may just be in prayer, coming to prayer. It may be being the best grandma you can be and the only witness maybe your grandchildren see. It may be the only kind face or kind word that your neighbor sees. But you are being a witness. You're being used. Don't ever sell yourself short. That is a lie of the enemy. Wherever you are in your Christian walk, do not allow the enemy to sell you short and say you have no place. Uh, and that as a child of God, I could see her growing, growing as she went with ups and downs of life, as we all struggle with. She grew in boldness, and that's when she started to beginning to be bold. We talked about that one night, and uh, I said, you know, Donna, I said, what do you have to lose by saying, yes, Lord? What do you have to lose? If you make a mistake, to say, hey, Lord, you know, I'm following you. This is your issue. Help, you know. But if you believe that the Lord can use you, he's going to help you through that growing period. And you're going to start finding yourself speaking forth. Um, she amazed me because she talked a lot of ho to homeless people around where she lived. And she would tell me stories of people uh, that she would take to dinner or she would just sit in the laundromat and visit with about the Lord. And there's some sketchy parts of her <laughs> where she lived. I was like, you're brave. Not that I wouldn't if the Holy Spirit used me to do that. But I just, I said, girl, I said, don't get yourself shot. I mean, you know, <laughs> but... She'd get tears in her eyes and she'd say, but Cynthia, I can just see they don't have anybody. They don't have anybody. So she, as she grew in her boldness and began to form into the lady of God that was being used in many places, not just Sunday school, she would tell me of the people again. She would meet in stores and employees at a workplace. And I was truly amazed uh, as she began to soar in the Lord, and yet not knowing that she was continuing in her journey towards the Lord. The last five years, Donna had been, not been feeling well. She struggled with uh, constant illnesses. After the removal of her gallbladder, she'd went to the doctor many, many, many times, and the doctor at that time would just say, you've got to heal, everything looks okay, don't worry about it. But as time went on, she had uh, had a physical at her work, and this is kind of uh, where she found out the seriousness of the situation. Uh, many of you know at your employee, they have um, people come in and do physicals, so you get the lower insurance rate, you know, if you're in good health and blood pressure is okay and that type of thing. Well, her blood tests that they took did not come back normal. They were, her white blood count was skyrocketing, and that's always a sign, most generally, that there's cancer somewhere in the body. Um, they did a CT scan on her and found the shadowing over the liver, on the kidneys, and her lung area. So they immediately sent her to an oncologist, which is a cancer doctor, to proceed with more tests. That's where she found out that basically the only option they gave her was chemo, and Donna was not going to do chemo. We had already talked the previous five years about it, and she said, I, I want the quality of life that I can have. I'm not going to do chemo. Now, that was her personal choice, and I honored that. And um, as she uh, stood in faith, and as Pastor said, never wavering, that was something about Donna that amazed me. Even though she went through her struggles, she would always say, I know my God is able. I know my God is able, and he's not going to leave me. Her, her health continued to go downhill. 
And Donna talked to me several times about going to the Cancer Center of America, which is there in Tulsa. And I said, you know, they, they have a different type of treatment there. They treat the whole body. They treat it with not just medication, but they treat it with a diet. They treat it with your faith. They honor your faith. They allow you to continue serving the Lord in the manner that you, are, you serve him. And um, they include nature. So it, it's kind of a holistic type of um, plan to help you walk through um, the time that you have. And there again, the doctor basically said, you only have chemo as an option. So she came back to Wichita. She was uh, here about a week, and she ended up back in the hospital. She was there two weeks. Her health continued to decline, and she got out for two days, and she called me, and she said, I'm getting worse. I've got to have somebody take me back in. That's when I began staying with her 24 hours. So that's where I'm going to pick up right here. I took Donna to the hospital 13 days ago now and was in the emergency room with her when the doctor came in and with tears in his eyes, he told her, you have about two weeks to live. As he left the room, he could only offer comfort in small procedures and medication as her time would draw nearer. We sat there in a moment of silence, both of us shocked. And if you've ever been in a place where the silence screamed at you, we were both there. We were totally just um, not prepared at all for that. Donna turned to me with tears in her eyes and she said, Sis, have I missed it? She said, what did I do wrong? I know God told me he was going to heal me. I was still in a moment of disbelief trying to process in my mind the last few moments from the doctor that I had heard and had I heard correctly what he had said. Then at Donna's question, I felt a surge from the Holy Spirit arise in me. And it came out from my feet. I mean, it was just full force. And I said, oh, no, no, you have done nothing wrong. God has healed you. He has given you the last five years in ministry. Don't forget that because he touched her. The Lord could have took her and allowed this cancer to take over her body five years ago when she was first diagnosed. But God told her in the middle of the night, I've healed you, go forth. And that's what she did. Then the Lord reminded me with the five years how the number five represents God's grace, his goodness, his marvelous, wonderful goodness. She smiled big with the peace of God on her face and knew now her steps were even closer to her heavenly home. The next five days, God faithfully was in that room. There was not a moment. There were nurses that would comment, um, what is that smell in here? <laughs> and I would smile because there was a couple times that I would catch just, just a scent of it. But it was... It was a heavenly scent. You could not describe the smell in that room. It was, it was and, and I tell you, it was God because every flower that came, she would grab a Kleenex or even the blanket and start, I'm not trying to be graphic, but gagging because smells just, she couldn't handle them. But the aroma in that room of the Holy, Pre of the Holy Spirit, the Lord's presence, she didn't, it didn't bother her. And I, I stood amazed. And you know, when you start seeing the hand of God right before you, you think, wow, Lord. We don't often think how precious we are to the Lord. You know, we get bound up in the daily struggles of life and 
paying bills and is my check going to make it and oh my gosh it's nine o'clock i got to be at church in 30 minutes and you know we do we we struggle with that you know pastors you get pulled this way you get pulled that way it's just a part of living down here on this earth but i literally saw the hand of the lord so many times during this last seven day journey that i was with donna and um, I have to say that uh, the moment, probably I would say just about a minute before she passed, there was a presence that came into the room. And it was so peaceful, you almost just fell asleep. I mean, it was, it was such a peace that it, it was like, oh my gosh, it was, um, you, you really didn't, it was almost like it transpired in a, in a way that it took every thought from your mind. It took every ounce of worry. Um, because, you know, when you're, when you're there um, with your best friend, and Donna and I have been best friends for 13 years. We went through a lot of things together. And your mind is thinking, how can I help? Because you love that person, and you don't want that person to go through as a nurse, what you know they're going to go through. And you're trying to grasp onto the scriptures, and you're trying to hang on to them, not knowing that God can't do it, but you've got emotions just going 90 to nothing. And there was family dynamics added to the pot. And I'm, I don't know how many times I called Pastor. He, he gave me my own special ring. I called him so many times. But... Um, at the presence, I knew, and you could almost feel it coming into the room. You know, it was just like it, it entered. That's, that was the best word I could say. It entered into the room. And that calming, I instantly, there was an awareness there that came into that room. And as I saw Donna um, take her last breath, there was such a peace there. It was almost like I waited to see the Spirit. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're so close to the Lord, and, and I was expecting something. I mean, I was sitting there expecting. I was not going to, I'd been awake for almost 48 hours, and I was like, I am not missing this. I, I want to know when the Lord comes in the room to get her. And in that moment, um, I, 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 did, I did see something that you don't see very often, and I want to share that. Do you know what your countenance looked like before you came to the Lord? Can you imagine what you look like before the Holy Spirit entered into your life? Be, um, receive salvation. I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about salvation. How many times have we prayed with people? And just in those few minutes we're praying with them after they receive salvation, you look at their countenance. They're the same person, but you see Jesus on their face. Can you testify to that? Well, I want to share this because I was totally amazed. After, after the Lord took Donna, I took her hand and I said, well... You made it before me. We used to tease each other. Who's going to get married first? Well, I got married first, and she was. The, we watched Raymond. I mean, we had girl time before she got to you know before she declined to the point where we couldn't. But we we'd watched Raymond and and we'd just talk and and be silly. And I said, you know, I'm really kind of jealous. I mean, you helped me with my wedding, and it was a beautiful wedding. I said, but you get the grandest hot dog of them all. I said, your bride is waiting for you with his hand waiting for you to walk down the aisle. I said, I hope when I get to heaven, you can tell me what your wedding dress looked like. You know, um, and I know that's not scriptural per se, but you have to understand in those type of circumstances, you know, you need to just be lighthearted and, and just kind of um, joke and love each other and tease and, she's, and, and she would say, well, that's what you get for taking off six months and leaving me here by myself. Because <laughs> after I got married, my husband, I, I went to Missouri with him for about six months, and then I came back. But um, I, I just want to share with you that 
now that Donna's home, her steps have led her home. Every step that we take in this life, every single step is leading us to the Lord. Our, our permanent home, our mansions in glory. And I want to encourage you, because we walk in a weary time right now. We walk in darkness that many of us just want to pull the covers up over our heads because it overwhelms us. And we have real life circumstances. We have grandkids that we love dearly, that we can't see. We can't um, be a part of their lives for whatever issues there are. We've got daughters and sons that um, I personally have raised off four of mine in church. They've all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many times I watched them over the years dance and praise the Lord around the altar. Where are they now? You know, we live in real life, in the nasty here and now. We do. And it's important that we realize every step we take, we're one step closer to home. Every single step, every step, we're one step closer, we're one step closer. And I know Donna herself, if she could stand up here and testify right now, um, she would tell you, don't give up, don't give up, keep walking. But I wanna just end this part with the fact that when Donna passed, uh, after I talked to her just a little bit and said, well, you made it, and you left me behind. I don't think that's kind of fair. Pastor and I was teasing each other about, boy, we really, I mean, not that we don't love being here, don't take me wrong, but if you're a true child of God, you think about being at home, because that's your permanent place of rest, you know, it is. <clears throat> but as I glanced at her for the last time, before I called the nurses in, um, her countenance had changed. She was not that precious, sweet Donna. And I say that because she couldn't be the same. Her spirit was gone. And when the Holy Spirit is absent from you, and even when we start falling away from the Lord, the Holy Spirit has to back up. Because when you start on your own journey, in your own self, and making your own choices for your life, he can't walk in that, that can't, he can't allow that countenance to shine. He's got to back up. And he says, he'll woo you. The Holy Spirit will talk to you. Where are you going? What about church? What about prayer? You haven't read your Bible. Not in works. I'm not talking works. I'm talking about the relationship that the Holy Spirit wants us to have every single day of our lives. How can he be a part of our lives if we keep him at arm distance or further? He can't. So you're missing out. You're the one missing out. But as I looked at her countenance, it dawned on me, this is the Donna that was in the world before she met the Lord. And it left a graphic picture in my mind because when God looks at us, he doesn't see us as we were before we came to him. He does not see us with sin. He sees us as perfection. And there again, we don't apply that to our lives. We don't think about that when we make our mistakes and when we sin or when we fall. We think the Lord's up there ready to bonk us on the head. I did many times. I mean, it took a while for, um, I remember one time pastor sat down up here on the step and he said, this is what I'm gonna do in the Lord. I'm gonna sit here and rest. I'm gonna let him do all the driving. And I sat right there, and I thought, that man is crazy. <laughs> now, you have to realize, I'm coming out of 30 years of law, okay? 
of oneness, oneness Pentecostal. I was coming out of that, and there was still a lot of stuff God was deprogramming in me. And that didn't make no sense because in my mind I thought, I've got to do something. I can't just sit there like he How can he say that? It did not make any sense to me. I mean, I went home that night thinking to myself, am I in the right church? I mean, how can anybody that serves the Lord just sit and rest? Well, it was like two weeks later, Brother Lauren came. And what did he preach? how to rest in the Lord. And I was like, don't ask me why I trust Brother Lauren over Pastor. I mean, I didn't have nothing against Pastor, but for some reason, I, I think it was the confirmation that the Lord was like, see, I told you so, I told you so, you know. But we all have those moments as we mature and we grow that we struggle with as, as Donna did. And uh, I, I, I do want to tell you that before she got to where she was unconscious there for the last couple days. Um, she kept holding my hand. Tell them I love them. Tell the people at the church I love them. And she said, I'm going to miss them. In my mind, I'm thinking, no, you're not, girl. You're going to the biggest party there is. You ain't going to be thinking about none of us down here. <laughs> but her heart was with you. And I wish the kids was in here because I really felt that was important for them to know too. Because I guarantee you, we prayed many, many, many nights over your children. And she made me promise, okay, now I'm going to glory. I still have three kids out there in the world. You promise that you'll continue praying for them. And I told her I would. And I actually, a couple of days ago in working with the family, I told him, I said, hey, just so you know, you got a second mom here. I said, and I'm not letting you go. Your mom made me promise I'm going to keep you in my prayers. And so you're mine now. And you better not mess with how I pray. <laughs> the oldest daughter has already asked for Donna's Bible. So I know God's starting to work. We talked often about whatever it takes, God, we want our kids. We want our kids. We're not giving up on those kids. And if this is part of the process it took for her kids to come home, Brother Mark just had a, a miracle with his son. He just re came down and gave his life, I think, a week ago, Brother Mark? A couple weeks? Oh, is this your parent? Oh, okay. Congratulations. Welcome to the crazy Berean assembly, <laughs> full of the Holy Spirit. You've been prayed for much, too. And I know, I know the reason, when I saw you walk in tonight, because I've been gone for a little bit, I was rejoicing in my soul, because mom's not here, and you're here. That, that's, that's awesome. Um, but when, w one thing I heard Brother Swaggart say real quickly, and I'm going to share with you what the Holy Spirit gave me. I heard him say something very impressive, and I've known it in my spirit, and I've applied it, but the way he said it was, if you want to see miracles in your life, pray for other people. Pray for their kids. Pray for their marriage situations. Pray for their financial situations. And I've always done that, not because I'm special, just because... I, that's just how I felt the Holy Spirit would lead me. But when he said it like that, I thought, how many of us do that? How many of us pray for that neighbor that throws leaves in our yard? <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to razz pastor there. Um, but, you know, it, it is real, you know that policeman that pulls you over and you know you're going over the speed limit but why did he stop me think about it <laughs> but, but we are we need to remember prayer is powerful it changes it divides the darkness that surrounds those you're praying for and yourselves we can't make it i don't know why People think they can make it in this world in the condition it is in right now without prayer. You can't do it. 
You cannot do it. And if you think you can, I pray for you because you might just be setting on a chair here in church when the rest of us go, if it's a church setting. And I'm not trying to be ugly, but you really need to think about it because prayer is a relationship. How do you talk to your best friend without talking to him? How do you develop a friendship without communication? You can't do it. And I don't know how many of us sign. Do any of us sign language? I'm talking sign language. Uh Uh-uh. You better be talking to the Lord. We live in a very serious time, and I know I keep uh, emphasizing this, but I have watched um, sorrowfully the condition of some of my friends here in the church. And I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to be honest because the Holy Spirit told me to. Some of us are slipping. We're not where we need to be with the Lord. It's not my business why you are, but it is his. And I want to challenge you. Remember, every step you take is taking you towards glory. And a cold heart. What does the Bible say about lukewarm? If you're lukewarm, he vomits you out of his mouth. So I I, I encourage you one thing. Just take time with the Lord and say, Lord, whatever the situation is, I need you. I'm too far away. Re-stir up those embers inside of me. Bring me back to where I was. I'm going to start, uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you what the Holy Spirit gave me this, this morning, and it was a three-hour process because um, not, not just being awakened, but um, part of what he had given me for Donna to kind of share in the way they were kind of intermingling. And, and um, so um, as I scratched it down and retyped it out so it, I, I could share with you, I want you to take this very seriously because this is a word from God. This is not Sister Cynthia. This is an anointed word from the Lord. I have watched too many of my people sitting, sitting on the sidelines. Is this not the final battle of your journey? Do you not know you have been called to be on the front lines of this battle. For you have been chosen by my hand to carry forth the truth. Yes, the truth, the truth of the message of the cross. Do you not know that my truth must go forth? I say again, it must, must go forth in this end time. I hear the calling out of the prayers of my people, and it is you that I have chosen. Again, I say to my children, if not you, then who? We'll go forth with my truth, for the darkness is great, and many are the souls that cry out. Does not my word say, that whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, knowing that I, your Lord, shall reward you with the inheritance of your heavenly home. Do not allow yourself to become a captive of the adversary. For do you not know that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy? I see even now the captivity that has settled in, causing you to lose your ability to worship freely in my presence. I see the captivity, the captivity of you not knowing your purpose in life and of your wandering to those things of the world. I see the captivity of you allowing the enemy to paralyze you, paralyze you in the spirit of fear. 
Do you not know that it is my perfect love that casts out the spirit of fear? Why do you look to the world for deliverance? Was not the price I paid enough? Was it not my blood that set you free? I say to you that I have paid the only price you need for that freedom. It was in the sacrifice of my son. I see the captivity of your confusion that the enemy has come against you with. And again, I tell you that I am not the author of confusion. But my spirit brings power and love and freedom of a sound mind. I say to you, do not become blind to the moving of my spirit in this end time. I say, do not become insensitive in the moving of my spirit. For it is my spirit that sets the captive free. Why do you focus on the darkness around you? I tell you that yes, I too see the darkness and it will not again I say that it will not overtake you. You are protected by my unseen hand. Look up, my children, for your redemption is even nigh at the door. Look up again, I say, look up, for your redemption is near. This is a warning with love from the Lord. He does not want to see any of his children lost, not even those that have not come to him yet lost. His desire is to take all of us with him. However, that choice lies in you. What do you want in your relationship with the Lord? What do you desire as a personal friend that you can talk to any time, any moment of the day, and always have him at your side listening to you. Never tearing you down, never using a harsh word, but loving you, even when he corrects you. He never beats you up, degrades you, slanders you. He takes care of you with love. Why would you not want a closer relationship with the Lord? Why would you not, even now in the time that we're in, the end time, almost home, waiting anxiously for that trump to sound, for his appearance? Why would you not want to know that your soul is at perfect peace and you're anxiously awaiting, just as Donna was anxiously awaiting? Uh, Brother Sam, would you guys come forward for me? The Lord gave me a song, and I said, Lord? And he goes, no. And the song is, Draw Me, Lord. And so I'm going to ask the musicians if they will come and just um, play this song and, and sing. And I want every single one of us to come up I'm going to woo you for the Lord. I want you up here in the front. And I don't care how you do it. If you have to set because you can't stand, that's fine up here. But I want all of us up here. Because in sharing the, the seriousness of the place that we are in right now, we're about to go into a video ministry. And trust me. If we're not where we need to be, as God brings in those lost souls, do you know you're going to have blood on your hands? Because just about every one of us here have been in this church, I would say, five or more years. There's a few, of, there's a few new faces. We are the body. We're the main body that God has said, go forth. I've given you the message of the cross. I've given you the truth. 
Don't stomp on it. Don't stick it in your pocket like it's of no value. Really? Does the blood of Jesus Christ, is it no value to you? God forbid. God forbid. The endless hours of prayer that I know pastors, these pastors have spent for us as we grow and so we can mature and become that next person to go forth. We're accountable, body of Christ. We're accountable. And so I just ask you, how, what, however you want to reach the Lord, talk to him right now in this place to stir up within you that call to stir up within you that place that he is calling you to and you may not be hearing it right now because you're too far from him we can't play we've got children we've got grandchildren we've got young adults we've got teenagers you've got friends and neighbors and families that need a place to go for refuge this is the house of refuge this is the only place they can go for the truth. Go ahead. This is where it begins, and I want to tell you something. You want it to continue, you have to do something different. Tomorrow, tonight, it's got to be different. We can't continue, that's what I've been preaching, to stir up the gift of God. 
We have got to stir it up. And the only way that it gets done is to do something different. When you're at your workplace and you go on break, break the habit of doing what you did and spend five minutes in prayer. You will notice and recognize a change. You will feel the presence of the Lord like you haven't felt Him in a long time. Because His Word says that if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Just those little steps like Sister Cynthia said. Every step, that is a step toward God. When you wake up in the morning and you usually just get up and you go get ready for the day. Stop. Stop. Spend time with the Lord. Even today, when I, I usually listen to some talk radio, because I love listening to the things about this nation and where we're at. But I felt something today, and I have felt it over the last couple of weeks. But I felt like it's not what I wanted, because it wasn't what God was wanting. So I turned it off. And I put it on Sun Life. And the presence of the Lord filled that bedroom. And I felt the Lord and my countenance changed. And that's what we're talking about. Your countenance changing. The status quo has got to go. That's what I was praying last night up here. The status quo has got... You've got to change something about what we've been doing. Because we, what we've been doing ain't getting it done in our lives. We're going through the same old motions, the same old thing, the same old thing. Religious repetition. And nothing's changing about us. Are we drawing closer to the Lord? Are we coming into His presence? Is that glory of God's presence on our face like it used to be? Hmm. Because sometimes what we do is we take that old salvation that we've got when it was nice and shiny and we just kind of stick it in a box. Just like a good old Christmas present that you got and you played with for a couple of weeks and then after it rubbed off, the news gone, you put it aside. No, we've got to stir up that gift of God on the inside of us. And I'm telling you something, it begins, and I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to me, the leadership. Pastor Jim, Pastor Gary, Pastor Lee, leadership. Because you're only going to go as far as we go. And as far as we go, we've got to repent about some things. Turning off the television. Turning off the things that we normally do. And begin to seek God's face. And begin to pray and get real about what God is doing. That's what we have to do. And we are a body like sisters. Cynthia said. We are a backbone of this house of God. We are. And you have to accept that responsibility. As the backbone of this house of God you have to act like it. You have to walk like it. You've got to be prayed up. You've got to be spirit-filled. You've got to seek His face. Because others, this is about others. This ain't about us. This is about those that are out there that have not seen the presence and the power of God. They don't know it because this world is preaching things that they don't, they don't have a clue about. Preaching psychology. Preaching all this revolution, grace revolution that you don't have to Ask God to forgive you of your sin. All the stuff in this world. This world does not know God. But we have the truth. And we have a responsibility to have that truth living on the inside of us. Living where it's a living faith. Oh, hallelujah. Where we believe what we're talking about. And we don't have to do it in a condemning way, but with joy. <laughs> because there's joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not about meat and drink, <laughs> but it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what it's about. And we have that on the inside of us. And if you don't, get on your face. Get on your face and begin to cry out to the Lord. I felt it last night. I don't mean to go on, but I feel this in my heart. I felt it last night whenever I was praying up here. I felt a groaning in my spirit. And I began to groan in, the, 
in the Holy Ghost. It wasn't prayer. It was a groaning in my heart for the people of this world that do not know God, that are dying lost and going to a devil's hell because a church won't stand up and won't sit up, won't speak up because we're too intimidated by the things of this world. But there is a groaning in the heart of God that's saying, I I felt it all day today. We've been talking about the Lord coming. Every time I hear that, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. Every time I hear about the rapture, the king is coming. My hair stands up. That's how real it is. That's how close it is. And God is trying to get us to understand. He's trying to get us to understand what this is about. This is not about us. This is not about us. And don't you ever think that God is not working. He's working. He's working right there in that man. He's working right there in that man. He's working. You might not see it in your kids. You might not see it in your grandchildren. You might not see it in your aunts and your uncles, your grandparents, or whoever you're praying for. You might not see it. But let me tell you something. God is working because He never stops working. He never slumbers nor sleeps. But we do. And that's what I'm talking about to stir up. Oh, God. When you can't sleep at night, get up. Get up. You got, I feel it in my heart. We have got to do something different. When he, he's gonna, he wants to draw us to prayer. <laughs> oh, we can get so comfortable in our salvation. So comfortable in those robes of righteousness. Oh, but we got to sometimes get down and dirty. And begin to war for those people that are lost. I have family members that are lost. And I want to continue. It begins here. It begins here tonight. That we do something different. That it's no longer the status quo. That you wake up and you pray that you get up and you pray that you get up and get in his word that whenever you go on break time get in his word when you go to lunch pray instead of eat oh I'm telling the truth oh hallelujah you mind if I dismiss pastor this is what we're going to pray Lord Oh, Lord God, lift up your hands. Oh, Lord, I see it again. Oh, Lord God, we're asking you today, Lord God, to stir up in our hearts, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, a groaning Lord God, in our spirit, Lord God, for the things of God, Lord God, that we lose, Lord God, the lust of our spirit, Lord God, for the things of God, Lord God, that we lose, Lord God, the luster, Lord God, of this world, Lord God, that the things, Lord God, of this world, Lord God, that they lose their grip upon us, Lord God, that we will no longer cleave and cling unto them, Lord God, but we will separate ourselves unto you and consecrate our lives unto you, Lord God, that we may be used of you, Lord, because we want your glory, Lord God. We want your touch, Lord God, upon our lives. We want your glory, Lord God, to rest upon us. We want your countenance upon our face. We want your joy living in our hearts, Lord God, that we may be, Lord God, people of God, and that this world might know that there is a God in heaven that loves them and that gave his Son for them. I pray it today, Lord God, that you draw us closer, draw us nearer, Lord God. Let us lose, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, the desire for the things of this world, Lord God, that we might love the things of God. Stir it up in our hearts today, Lord God. We believe you, Father God, for it today, Lord God. For a greater, Lord God, anointing. For a greater presence in your life, Lord God. Open up your word to our hearts. Open up your word, Lord God, to our lives, Lord God. Open us up to your word. Help us to understand it and to know it, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, let it speak to our hearts. Speak to our spirits, God. Help us to hear your voice, Lord God. Help us to know the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you may minister your grace to us, Lord God, and that you may minister your grace through us, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, we, Lord God, just surrender ourselves to you, Lord God. We yield ourselves to you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. Use us, Lord God, for your glory, Lord God. 
Oh, Lord God, prepare us, Lord God, to be a sanctuary, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, separated, consecrated unto you, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father God. We're asking, Lord God, for a move of your spirit, Lord God, this Sunday. We're asking, Lord God, for the presence of the Holy Ghost, Lord God, to fill this sanctuary, Lord God. That everyone, Lord God, that comes into this house of God, that feels, Lord God, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. That they would give their lives to you, Lord God, that do not know you. Those that are cold and indifferent, Lord God, that you would, Lord God, touch their hearts and speak to them, Lord God. And let them feel and know, Lord God, your love for them, Lord God. And your drawing and your wooing of them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. We're asking for your touch upon Pastor Jim, Lord God, for your anointing, Lord God, with the Holy Ghost, Lord God, that your word, Lord God, would be in his heart, Lord God, like a fire, and that you would give him a boldness, Lord God, with the Holy Ghost to make known the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that he preach it with a boldness, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. We're asking for the anointing, Lord God, upon your people, Lord God, your worship team, Lord God, those that you've called, Lord God, to lead us, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch them, Lord God, and bless them, Lord God, and anoint them, Lord God. Fill them with the Holy Ghost, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, and draw them close. Closer, Lord God. Use them, Lord God, by the power of your spirit, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Father God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. Touch, Lord God, the teachers, Lord God. Touch the ushers, Lord God. Touch the greeters, Lord God. Touch, Lord God, the sound ministry, Lord God. Touch us, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, touch us, Lord God, and have your way, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Father God. We give your name glory. We give your name praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we bless your name, Father. And we ask it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you just touch us. Touch us, bless us, and use us, Lord God. And we give your name glory, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.